So the book is by two colleagues from the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London, uh, both working in the Japan unit there. So Robert Ward, next to me here, uh, holds the Japan chair at IISS, um, and he's also the director of geoeconomics and strategy uh, for that think tank. Um, prior to that, he was editorial director at the Economist Intelligence Unit. Uh, and he has extensive Japan experience, having lived and worked there from 1989 to 1996. And his colleague, uh, Yuka Koshino, um, is also at International Institute for Strategic Studies, uh, where she's research fellow for security and technology policy. Uh, and she was previously at the uh, uh, Asia Pacific Initiative in Tokyo as the inaugural Matsumoto Samata Fellow. Um, and she previously served as a research associate with the Japan Chair uh, at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And that's probably all I need to say in introduction, so I'll hand over to you, Robert. Um, thank you for that uh, introduction, and uh, absolutely spot on, uh, so much appreciated. Um, I'm Robert, uh, and uh, as was just said, I'm the uh, Japan Chair, uh, and actually Yuka and I were the inaugural team of the IISS uh, Japan Chair Program, and um, this program pretty special actually because it was the first such uh, in uh, Europe, uh, and it was endowed generously by the Japanese government uh, in 2019. Um, and I joined the IISS in 2019 December, and uh, Yuka in uh, in January. Um, we are mandated to think about Japanese foreign policy, security policy, um, international uh, posture, all of that. Uh, but we have complete uh, carte blanche to do what we like. We're not interfered with by the Japanese government. It's been very good in just letting us do uh, what we think is uh, what we think is uh, important. Um, this book, um, which uh, you've just been shown, um, this is in a sense the the fruit of uh, our two years of developing the uh, Japan uh, program at the institute. Uh, the IISS is known for its, uh, its focus on defence and military analysis. That's the sort of beating heart of the, of the programme. And when we were thinking about the topic uh, for the uh, programme, um, we wanted to just do something that was related to security, uh, Japanese power, um, all of this, this sort of war power rules triptych that the um, Institute views uh, issues through. Um, but we didn't want to necessarily focus just on military kit and, and all of that. We want to just think about security in a broader means. And um, this uh, book is the sort of result of that focus on trying to look at Japan's um, power projection, uh, how it uh, has evolved um, over the years. And of course, we have a particular focus on, uh, on the late uh, Prime Minister Abe, uh, particularly in his second, um, uh, his second term. Um, over the, the last sort of 20 years or so, I, I first went to Japan in 1989, uh, August, so that was just, uh, I was on one of the, I was the third year, I think, of the JET program, so sort of pioneer uh, in, in Kyushu. The bubble was still uh, sort of beaming brightly, um, uh, and then of course burst a couple of, uh, couple of years uh, later. But having that sort of perspective, I think, gives me um, a sort of particular uh, sort of I intensity around just how much has changed uh, in Japan over the last uh, over the last 10, uh, 10 15 uh, years or so. Um, the rise of China, I think, has made Japan's role uh, more urgent. And Japan describes itself um, as sort of in terms of strategic indispensability. Uh, now, this is how the, some of the economic security policy uh, is being formulated, and this all obviously is looking. Um, partly at um, partly at China, um, this activism we also see uh, in Japan's response to uh, what's going on in Ukraine, Russia's invasion uh, of Ukraine. Um, for those of us sort of that viewed uh, what how Abe, when he was prime minister the second time, uh, dealt with Russia in the uh, after the 2014 annexation, and then of course after the Skripal case here. Um, Japan's response here has been really to, to the Ukraine issue crisis um, has really been very strong um, and principled. Uh, and again, I think suggesting that this activism that we saw under Abe um, will continue. 
Um, in this book, we look at the drivers of this, um, of this transformation, uh, particularly in terms of geoeconomic power. We didn't want to go down, this book is not supposed to be an academic book, so it's supposed to, the, the mission of the Adelphi books are to enlighten the general reader. So we could have gone down a, a sort of a geoeconomic rabbit hole, we could have gone down a geopolitical, geoeconomic rabbit hole, what's the difference, what are the similarities, but we didn't do that because that was a bit deathly for, for everybody. So we decided to just define economics very broadly as deploying economic instruments to secure foreign policy aims and to project power. And there is a difference with, with, between this and, and geopolitics, which we can talk about if you want to, but we didn't sort of make it horrendously academic uh, to spare the reader. Why does geoeconomic power matter for Japan? Well, given the constraints around Japan's uh, projection of full uh, spectrum power, um, renouncing war, limits on the maintenance of war potential and so on. The flexing of its geoeconomic endowments, so the size of its economy, um, its markets, um, all of that, um, is a key means by which Japan um, can, uh, and under Abe in particular, as we'll see, uh, seeks to balance China's influence uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Um, China, well, a very important point here, China projects power geoeconomically. Uh, China is now the world's second largest economy. It may or may not become the world's largest economy, but it is a continental-sized economy. It has geoeconomic endowments in, in great uh, profusion, uh, and it uses this, whether it's through economic coercion, whether it's through the Belt and Road Initiative, whether it's through economic inducement. So this, um, this insight into the need to flex geoeconomic power, I think, is a, is a very important part of, uh, of Abe's uh, legacy. Um, given uh, Japan's strategic importance in the region, it's all, it's all very well to think we are a, that it is a geoeconomic power, but the key, and this is part, the key part of the conclusion of the book, the effectiveness of this geoeconomic uh, power projection is particularly important, again, given the uh, defense uh, constraints noted. Also important in the book is the, um, what we think is a, is a contribution to the literature is the identification and analysis of the economics and traditional security convergence. Um, and we had a bit of a chat earlier uh, before the um, event, uh, and we said, well, what's someone like you doing in the IISS, which is all about um, military and defense analysis? But now, of course, economics uh, and economic power is also a security issue and also important for, uh, for power uh, projection. The other point that we make in the book is the um, the point that middle powers have a responsibility to un uphold what we sort of loosely call the international order. Great powers don't have to worry about it. That's what makes a great power great. They can do what they like. So it's up to the middle powers to, uh, to try and uphold the, um, the rules-based order. They have a responsibility, and, uh, and we think what Japan is doing uh, in this uh, is, is, is unique. Um, importantly as well, uh, the next few decades are going to be transformative for the global economy. Um, by 2060, according to OECD data, I think, the U China, US, India will be the largest three economies, no surprise there, um, but each of these three economies, economies will be larger than the next five economies uh, combined. So sort of tremendous convergence and, and, um, and uh, concentration of economic power that um, Japan is the next best placed economy, next largest one we'll have to deal with. Very quickly, before I hand to Yuka, we, in the book, we, we, do, we have a little bit of history, so we look um, we, at Japan's journey to geoeconomic actor um, since the post, it's the end of the Second World War. We look at the two Nixon shocks, how Japan um, calibrated policy as a, after that. We look at the development of the Fukuda Doctrine, which we think was the first, uh, was an important um, uh, bit of geoeconomic uh, policy. Uh, we look at uh, Prime Minister, a little bit of Prime Minister Ohira Mas Masayoshi, Prime Minister in 1978 to 1980, and he's uh, a, a, a part of uh, Kishida's political line lineage, of course, at the moment, and how he developed um, a sort of view of comprehensive uh, security and thinking about um, geoeconomics uh, within that. We look at the period after the 1990 first Gulf War, which was a trauma. I was in Japan at the time, and uh, there was a lot of, sort of rabbit in headlights uh, in uh, feeling in, in Tokyo. Um, we look at the Asia crisis, uh, China's first 
flexing of geoeconomic muscle by not devaluing the renminbi in 1997, very important. And that was, that was one of the turning points, I think, between Japan and, um, and China in terms of influence uh, in, in the region. We then look at the Koizumi administration, the, the response to the uh, war on terror, the US, which we, which we agree with uh, others, was unprecedented by uh, Japanese uh, standards. Uh, we then look at the first Abe administration and then the DPJ, the three prime ministers of the DPJ in three years. Not actually that different from the UK at the moment, actually, given the uh, frequency of prime ministerial change. Um, but then the Abe administration, the second uh, Abe administration, um, which we think, and I think is, is fairly uh, consensus now, was one of the most transformative um, administrations in Japan since the end of the uh, Second World War. It's worth listening to his 2014 Shangri-La Dialogue speech, which is, which is available on the MOPA website, I think, and on our website. Um, very prescient talking about the importance of the rules-based order. And this was ahead of his time, because at the time we were still thinking China was going to be part of um, a bit more benign uh, than it actually has, has, uh, has ended up being. Um, also unique about Abe was this mixture of internal balancing and external balancing. So it was a sort of a through composed view uh, of policy uh, on the internal side, um, security changes, the 2015 legislation, the, the new um, security legislation to enable the new Japan US defense cooperation guidelines, institutional changes, the National Security Council one of the most important institutional changes in Japan, again, since the end of the Second World War, in our view, uh, the national security strategy, uh, abenomics, of course, um, as well. Uh, and then external balancing with the free and open Indo-Pacific uh, concept. Again, very unusual for a Japanese leader to give a name to a region. Uh, Indo-Pacific wasn't, of course, Abe's own invention. I think that was a German in the 1920s. Uh, but he revived it, and now, thanks to what Abe did, the Indo-Pacific is, um, is now in common usage. Uh, the CPTPP, of course, which we think was the biggest, um, I think certainly was the biggest uh, foreign policy success uh, of the Abe, uh, Abe period. The, G the CPTPP, not just a, um, a, a mechanism for increasing trade, but also it, uh, it has the geopolitical, geoeconomic um, element to it, uh, too. Um, what we think, again, was unique about this um, second administration, um, but evident before, was Abe's early uh, identification um, of China. And I mentioned China a little bit earlier. Um, but I think Abe was, sort of, was ahead of his time in understanding that China was not going to be a benign actor. I think he also had a, 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 a highly strategic mindset, again, which set him out from other, other politicians, other leaders um, in Japan. He understood the importance of geography, and this sounds like a very basic thing, but actually when you're trying to formulate policy, geography is important. Um, there's a very good uh, uh, YouTube video with H.R. McMaster uh, interviewing uh, the, 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 at that time the ex-Prime uh, Minister Abe, um, and he talks about the, pro the geographical proximity of China. And it's such an obvious thing to say, but it's a sort of, I think it's an unusually um, precise uh, understanding of Japan's place in, um, towards China and within the region. And thanks to Abe's YouTube thing, I learned a new um, four kanji word, uh, which was uh, Ichi Itaisu, which I think is, um, Japan and China separated by this very this was a narrow stream of water, as a sort of a little uh, vignette, if you like, of his geographical understanding. He also understood um, that, J that Japan and China are interlinked, are, that Japan cannot sort of just walk away from China. And this, I think, is an important um, lesson for other countries. You can't just cut China off because China is you know, is in your pockets, perhaps in your phone. <laughs> China is, I am wearing China, um, and so on. You can't walk away. And one of the things in, um, that we quote in our book is uh, looking at Abe's Utsukushi Kunye, his, his sort of manifesto, that I think came out in um, 2004, four, five, or six, um, when he talks about China and Japan as the kitemo uh, kirenai goke kanke. So this sort of, this relationship that you cannot that is unseverable, you're sort of bound together. 
Um, but of course, the other thing was the, the speed um, of China's rise, which of course I think triggered Abe's thinking. Uh, it's a couple of data points here. In 2000, China's economy was just a quarter the size of Japan's, and it overtook Japan's in 2010, and it's now three times larger. Un unprecedented speed here. Uh, in 2000, uh, Japanese and Chinese defense budgets were similar. Um, China's is now four times larger. So you can see in the space of just 20 years just how quickly this has, has turned around. My last point here before I hand to Yuka, what does this mean for Japan's future posture? Well, one of the things we talk about in the book is this sort of low posture that you had with um, after Yoshida Shigeru, after the, after the end of the Second World War. I think it was associated with Prime Minister Ikeda Hayato, uh, 1960 to 1964, he was Prime Minister, when he was focusing on income doubling and the sort of rapid growth period, um, and just the, the low posture meant just let's keep um, defense uh, down to a minimum and let's concentrate on the economy. Um, Abe was a structural break in that. Um, the focus on geoeconomics was an important part of that. Uh, we don't think that Japan is going to go back to this uh, low posture. Uh, quietism is another way that, that it's been put, that Japan is really being, is here to, to remain active in the region. And if you look at the, the security debate in uh, Japan, doubling in, uh, defense spending and so on, I think that's sort of quite a strong evidence that that is, um, that is the case. Um, it's unlikely to return to this low posture, but, but because to do so um, would in effect mean acquiescing to Chinese hegemony in the region. And this, I think, the Japanese um, public and politicians, this is not something that they think is in their um, national interest. We also say there's going to, we don't think there's going to be a, what we call a revolutionary scenario in the sense of constitutional change, uh, despite what Kishida has said about uh, about revising the constitution. I, we think he will be very timid uh, and cautious on that. He's, he won't want to spend his political capital <coughs> on that. But we think the more likely scenario is one uh, in terms of Japanese power projection in the region in which Japan continues to project geoeconomic power, trying to, what we, trying to maintain what we call economic interoperability uh, with the US where it can uh, and continues to try and play a, an active role in setting rules in areas such as trade uh, and new domains. But there are issues around that, uh, sort of complicating issues that are un uniquely Japanese, uh, which I think Yuka will um, address now. Of course, well, thank you. And first of all, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. I'm delighted to be here today. Um, so Robert just laid out why geoeconomics, the thinking of geoeconomics matters today, especially amid you know, US-China strategic competition, how Japan tried to pursue that, and how Prime Minister Abe's administration, um, former Prime Minister Abe's um, administration was a kind of structural break in Japan's kind of grand strategy perspective. Um, but, you know, our book is about the effectiveness of geoeconomic power, so I would like to, uh, in my comments, I would like to highlight the four factors that we had identified in our research um, that will affect, um, you know, the effectiveness of the implementation of this strategy. So the first is the outwardness of Japan's, I mean, outwardness of Japan's diplomatic posture. So Japan cannot, or Japan or any other country, um, they cannot meet the challenges alone. However, it can often, you know, Japan often takes an inward approach in foreign policy issues, often driven by domestic political interests and its unique kind of shimaguri mentality as an insular country as Japan's famous strategist, Kosaka Masataka, has previously mentioned back in 1965. So it's a kind of like long-term historical, um, you know, concept and tendency that Japan, you know, looking back in the kind of longer term, there's always this tendency of becoming inward versus outward. And in that sense, um, as Robert just laid out, um, former Prime Minister Abe and his successors' um, pursuit of Japan's kind of proactive and active global diplomatic and security role is more like a new trend um, and an outlier looking back this history. But how sustainable is this trend is really a key here. Japan's, for instance, I mean, now they're starting to finally open up um, visa-free tourists. Um, I think there was an announcement this morning. Um, but Japan's enduring COVID-19 border restrictions, for instance, on foreigners could be raised an example of how it could suddenly turn backwards from a free and open uh, Japan in, in the case of a crisis. And, and, the measure, and that measure has contracted Japan's uh, Japanese economy, limited people-to-people -people interactions 
which are critical to maintain the diplomatic ties and maintain the geoeconomic literacy, maybe more strategic literacy more broadly among policymakers, businesses, and the wider society. So the pursuit of economic security also has risks of turning a Japan become more inward. So as Robert mentioned, this new concept of strategic indispensability is quite unique and interesting because it's more of an active thinking of you know, using the choke points and, and to leverage um, its strength to pursue um, its strategic goals. But it, the, the other concept that was listed in Japan's economic security, uh, strategic economy, which is also a shared kind of um, concept in Europe when it approaches its own economic security as well, but you know, onshoring of semiconductors and, and, and all that has great risk of turning Japan and all those industry, industrial policies could have the potential to uh, lead Japan back to a more inward posture. So sustainability of Japan's outwardness and openness um, would be key for Tokyo to closely coordinate and strengthen its existing partnership to develop an, um, and also to develop new partnerships with like-minded partners um, to tackle the complex geoeconomic issues um, together. And the second factor is the fragmentation um, within the policy-making community and the society itself. So Tokyo's recent efforts to take a whole-of-government approach to tackle the economic security issues is a good step forward to tackle all those, like, you know, these two economic challenges that we have been talking today that involve security issues, economic issues, and, and everything. Um, but such an effort is now recognized and as an innovative approach uh, from an international perspective, such as setting up an economic security, economic division within the National Security Secretariat, and there's a new economic security minister, probably the world's first economic security minister, to really speed up the passage of the economic uh, security promotion law that passed in, back in um, May. However, the government industry relationship also remains to be a major challenge for success. There's a lot of examples that we raised in our book, um, but just taking a snapshot of today, um, the industries are struggling to relocate a supply chain from China after the pandemic, and to also to enhance resilience of the supply chain um, in, in the US-China competition and the discussions around decoupling. So industries are also not convinced yet about the Kishida government's new R&D plans for critical technology in the realm of 5G, AI, artificial intelligence, quantum, under the new economic security framework, which is also about how to promote and develop the critical technology, especially the dual-use technologies that are going to be the driver for future economic growth. Um, so the private sector is a main actor also in the great game of geoeconomics today. And their alignment um, between the government is also essential for success. So coordination among all these actors are critical um, for the resilience of this geoeconomic strategy. And there's also various reasons why this industry-government relationship has, which used to be very close during the post-war period, to grow Japan's economy. Um, example would be the globalization and, and, and the, the role of internet, which allow the companies to go and, and expand their businesses abroad by themselves. And another is, of course, you know, the Japan, Japan's industrial policy, which led to Japan's post-war uh, long-term economic growth, has been criticized um, by the United States, for instance, and there were a lot of um, some, some kind of corruptions and, and relationship between the government industries that were not really healthy, con considered healthy in the Japanese society. So those tendency to try to um, you know, separate the industries and the government and also this globalization um, is now a challenge when the industries and government um, has to work together to think about what are the security dimension of the economic um, of, of their businesses that they need to think about when they think about the, um, the, the kind of broader geoeconomic um, issues. So this leads to the third factor, uh, which is the ideological division, which have constrained Japan's effort um, to overcome the major fragmentation within the society uh, to fully unleash its geoeconomic power, which is the technology dimension of this geoeconomic power. Critical and emerging technologies like 5G, artificial intelligence, quantum science, space technology, so big data, these are drivers for today and future economy, as I just mentioned, but they're also essentially dual use, and that is the reason for becoming a focal point. The technology is becoming a focal point of today's US-China competition. So harnessing innovation in these areas um, for Japan's economic competitiveness while protecting the outflow of such sensitive technologies um, are going to be very important, and that's why um, the closer coordination between the defense um, sector and the civilian sector is also going to be important. 
and the anti-militarism culture that still remains strong in Japanese society, especially in the academic world, um, has, however, historically limited such interactions between the two defense and the civilian communities. Currently, for instance, Japan's defense minister doesn't have a seat in Japan's long-term science, technology, and innovation strategy-making process, and the defense ministry also has a minimum role to play. So the number of academic institutions' participation, for instance, in the Defense Ministry's uh, National Security Technology Research Promotion Fund, which was established in 2015 to foster basic uh, research into dual-use technologies, um, again, like a AI, quantum, um, and, and uh, sensing technology, advancement materials, are sharply declining after the Science Council of Japan uh, pledged in 2017 that academic institutions will never become engaged um, in scientific research for military purposes. Such a fragmentation will challenge the government's ability to prevent the outflow of sensitive technologies, to develop an integrated national science and technology strategy to harness innovation, and even the international security and technology cooperation with partners who further remain competitiveness in these areas. In the long term, we observe that we will have significant uh, th this will have significant consequences, not just for Japan's technological capabilities and industrial com competitiveness, but also its ability to shape the standards, rules, and norms in these new areas that have become focal point for the U.S.-China strategic competition. The final factor I want to raise today is, um, and what we, we've um, written in our book, is the relationship with the United States which is Japan's only treaty ally, the world's largest economy, and an important balance in power against uh, the rise of China in the Indo-Pacific region. Alliance management will be key for Japan to protect um, and pursue its geoeconomic interests. But historically, the US has both uh, catalyzed and also limited Japan's geoeconomic power. The United States have, for instance, helped Japan improve its geoeconomic <coughs> literacy on important geoeconomic <coughs> issues, such as, as Robert mentioned, joining uh, the, the TPP, um, administration under the Obama administration on uh, or understanding the security risks of using Chinese vendors for its, uh, its telecommunications uh, infrastructure, its critical digital infrastructure in, in Japan, like 5G, and the United States has also uh, spurred Japan to pursue a more ambitious carbon neutral goals to achieve, in, achieve this, uh, the 2015 Paris Agreement. The America First unilateral approach under the Trump administration and the U.S. retreatment from TPP also urged Tokyo to fill in that regional and global leadership gap to maintain the world-based order. The pursuit of free and open Indo-Pacific vision to um, um, bring together like-minded partners. <coughs> and in, in contrast, um, the trade friction throughout the 1980s and 1990s um, have urged Tokyo to restrain its semiconductor export to the United States and refrain from, the, uh, for instance, developing the domestic fighter jet that was key for Japan's indigenous air power capabilities. These were consequential for Tokyo's, um, you know, to maintain semiconductor manufacturing capabilities. That was very, you know, key for this uh, important today, and also to have a sustainable and technologically capable uh, defense industries. Unilateral sanctions against China, Chinese tech firms, and export control measures under Trump continued by Biden also pressured Japanese tech firms from using Chinese and U.S. content. And under FOIP, the two countries were also, um, are also <coughs> co closely coordinating in their approaches to counter China's um, Belt and Road Initiative and economic security, but the latter also has the risk of turning inward, as I mentioned earlier, and emphasizing the divergent approaches between the United States and Japan. Other recent announcements also shows and the new frameworks like the, um, the US-Japan economic uh, 2 plus 2 are some promising signs that the two countries are, there are mechanisms <coughs> that are emerging um, for the two countries to coordinate on their, these different approaches. So this brings to my final, final point. So what are the keys for Tokyo's geoeconomic effectiveness? Japan's external environment is highly dynamic, which places a premium on, on Japan's ability to adjust its geoeconomic strategy uh, so that it remains effective. We have uh, identified three interlinked uh, key areas for Japan to be effective as a geoeconomic actor in this book. So first is the economic health, of it, which is um, to project its geoeconomic power and to maintain resilience of its strategy. This requires the government's ability to coordinate with the private sector, and to maintain the resilience of Japan's strategically important sectors or the basic industries such as the automobile industries and the semiconductors. 
Second is Japan's continued investments in security posture to protect its geoeconomic interests. Mm -hmm. Maritime security to support supply chain of Japan's core industries, enhanced cybersecurity um, to, to protect its in critical infrastructure, protecting space assets, for instance, are kind of obvious examples that suggest the need um, for strong security backing for the geoeconomic strategy to be successful. And the third is the improved military-civilian interaction, military-civil inter interaction uh, to effectively maintain Japan's technological competitiveness, especially in the digital realm, which has become the focal point of the US-China competition. Japan, not just the US-China competition, but also for Japan's uh, economic growth and security. So these are the, the three main interlinked areas that uh, we focus on and, um, and we believe that uh, Japan, it will be key for Japan's effectiveness of the geoeconomic uh, strategy. I'll end my comments here, thank you. <laughs>